Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. I'm in Melbourne, Victoria. So for us, it's afternoon and it's Benetta here from Your Anxious Teen. Today, I want to talk about fear. Yeah, fear is a big thing at the moment, particularly, isn't it? Because, you know, with the COVID thing that's going on, plus our own fear about what might happen, um, what might happen in our life, as well as what might happen to our team. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about my story with fear. And then I'm going to give you a few little pointers, if I can, to help you to deal with this in a better way. So my story with fear. I didn't realise that when I was feeling fearful about my son's um, anxiety, depression, he had an illness too, so that was on top of things. I didn't realise how much that played a part in how I was dealing with things. When you're in um, a relationship of any type, whether that's with a spouse or whether it's with a you know, family member or whether it's you know, a child of yours, things really change, don't they? Someone really close to you is doing things or having problems or feeling hurt and you really feel like, you know what, how can I deal with this? I was only talking about, um, I was only talking about fear of something this morning with a client's parent. And she was saying, you know, I, I always am different with them where, than when I'm actually trying to deal with their, you know, the fear of what they're going through. So she was saying about researching. I was researching this and researching that and I look at every video about things and I read books about it. And then she said, but when I'm around my child, I don't do that. You know, I'm just normal mum and I'm happy-go-lucky and I pretend that everything's okay. When you're pretending, do you not think that your child is actually picking up on the energy around, around the two of you, around that subject, around the relationship? If you think they're not picking up on it, then you're very much mistaken. If we have animals that can pick up on our energy, then how do you think that we have children who pretty much know us well, that they don't pick up on that energy too? When my son was having a really bad time, I would look at things. I would just, you know, Google it. I would be on YouTube. I would try and find out how to deal with those problems. But all I was doing was perpetuating the cycle of this fear. Now, I have a story as well about Melbourne, right? Because we are being locked down intermittently by the government saying that we can't um, go into people's houses, we have to wear masks everywhere, we have to QR code, or we have to close our business down. And I think that the government don't realise that they're perpetuating this fear among us. That if they just said, okay, let's be more cautious, let's, you know, um, probably not go into big crowds when there's big numbers of COVID around. But at the moment, we're in single figures. We've been in single figures ever since we got locked down, which was, mm, I think, four weeks ago now. And they're starting to lift some of the restrictions. However, for businesses, because there's a lack of money, because there's a lack of knowing when your business is going to be closed down again, when there's a lack of the children going to school and so therefore you're having to homeschool, there's also a lack of feeling confident 
and knowing that things are going to improve because from a couple of times ago we have found that we have been locked down straight away people have refused to go on holiday because they don't know if they're going to get locked into um, not being able to get home so when it's when it's about our whole existence how can we then concentrate on having fun being more calm so that we can actually think things through because we're sent into chaos and my programs are all called chaos to calm if we're in a chaotic state of mind then we can't think clearly we can't focus we have this mentality of overwhelm this is what happens when we have a child who is hurting deeply, who is cutting themselves, who can't go out because they're so anxious. And it just creates this feeling that we can't do anything. We can do some things though, can't we? Because if we are calm, if we are calm and we come from our conscious mind, so we have two minds, right? Subconscious being the emotional brain and the conscious brain being the one that calms everything down, is curious, is wants to work out a solution, is logical. So if we can actually calm this emotional brain, this subconscious brain that takes us back to how are we going to pay the bills, how are we going to um, move forward, what's next? If we can calm this part of our brain, we can start thinking in a much more logical manner. When it comes to trying to help our teen, the best way that we can do that is to Talk to them in a calm way. The more we start raising the voice, using our tonality to try and get our point across, this creates the fight or flight, or even freeze, but mainly fight or flight at the moment because our team doesn't have the ability to really consider how they're going to move forward. That is our job. As a guide, it's our job. When I talk to parents and teens, it's much easier because the parent can then come to me with their concern. I can talk to the teen about that concern logically, calmly, and I also know what might be going on in the subconscious brain. Because believe me, the subconscious brain has its own agenda. Knowing that the subconscious brain has its own agenda and that it's nothing to do with the logical side of things can really help you and your team. Because we want to bring in some of these, these things that they can do for themselves, the things that they can do for themselves, and to encourage them along the way. So what did I learn about fear? And what did it make me do? So I've got a few things here that I realise were perpetuated by my fear. I took away all his decision-making because I felt that he couldn't make decisions or good decisions for himself. The only thing that that really did though was make him feel more powerless. So even though he was making bad decisions, I wasn't sitting down calmly with him and saying, okay, what do you think about that decision that you made? 
What do you think made you feel that that was the right decision for you? I just made them for him because I knew he was making terrible decisions for himself. I also felt powerless. I felt as though there was no one in the world that could understand me. How wrong could I be? How wrong could I be that there was no one who could understand me? And that it was him that needed to go and do all the, I don't know, psychology, counselling, hypnotherapy, healing, whatever it was that was necessary. Why did I think that it was only him? Because it was actually also me. He was feeling ashamed of himself, but he couldn't allow me to see that because if he did that, then it was also allowing me to see how I felt because I was ashamed of him, right? I was ashamed of the way he looked. I was ashamed of the things he was doing. And as a mother, you just don't want to feel that way. So I, I started, I suppose, thinking about what my expectations were. Because if I didn't expect anything, and I didn't expect the worst, or I didn't expect the best, I could just go minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, and see how things progressed, right? So for me, it was just go from this minute. Just go for another hour, another day, and take it as it comes. And quite honestly, it was much better for me rather than thinking further ahead because the more that I perpetuated that fear of what was his life going to look like, how was he ever going to go outside the door, let alone go to a football match or go out with his friends. And the more I allowed that to just sit and each day I would encourage him, it got better. I think that also this fear, I felt totally controlled by it. That I couldn't go out and do something, that I couldn't go out and be who I wanted to be, that I couldn't go on holiday, whereas I knew I really should. I needed to do those things. So when I actually looked at how it was claiming my life and how the fear was just holding me back, I felt that I couldn't do it anymore. I felt that it was time for me to be able to help other people. So that was what really pushed me to doing something more. It was helping other mothers, great mothers like myself, to cope with what was going on, but also to help those teens. Because the more that I help the mothers, and the more that we actually sit down and think about what we're doing and why we're doing it, then the more that would help them. So what was I really afraid of? What was I really afraid of? And this didn't come to me until I did a course whereby um, I was asked that question, what was I really afraid of? So the first thing was that he would die, that he would die and that I would be left thinking to myself that I could have done better, that I could have done more, that I could have gone further, I could have pushed him more. But when I decided that, you know what, I had put my own life on hold for so long because of his inability to move forward, I decided that, you know what, I would look into life after death. I would look into um, what happened when people had near-death experiences because 
then it would put my mind at rest that if he did die, that this wasn't the end. This wasn't something that I could have prevented because the thing is, is that I couldn't prevent it. I could do everything in my power to try and help, but I couldn't prevent it. So yes, Adair, it is the number one fear, I think, of parents is that your child will die and you will feel guilty the rest of your life. I now know that I have done whatever I could, not only to help my child, but also to help myself and the mothers and children who come to me. Because by doing that, I feel that I've done my job over and above. And I feel that that's also my calling or my passion is to help mothers realize that they're not responsible. One of the things that I really would say to someone is look at the perception of the child. Look at the perception of the child because whatever they perceive is what's in the core problem here, is that they're perceiving something that's happened as that that has to be the end for them. That has to be a life decision. Whereas we're making decisions and choices every day of our life, aren't we? We make those choices every day of our life, as do our teens. So I couldn't decide for him whether he was going to be here or not. I couldn't be afraid either of that he was going to get sick again because he might. You know, he might get sick again and it might be because of what he's doing and what he's perceiving, but I can't change that. So trying to empower him to take those decisions of his own, his own um, health. Okay, what about the fear that he wouldn't love me? The fear that he wouldn't love me because he was going to blame me. And you know what? When people are hurting, they often blame those that they love because they know that they'll still be loved. So when I looked at that, I know that he loves me. I know that he always has loved me, even though sometimes he may have blamed me for something I didn't or did do. Well, that's just the way it goes, right? So for me now is to not take that personally. So this is one of the big things I'm going to tell you. Do not take what they say personally. If they feel they're being judged or attacked, and that's their perception, right? This is their perception. If they feel that they're being attacked or judged, then they will fight back usually. I'd be more afraid of someone who goes away and doesn't say anything about something because that means they're internalizing it. If they're having a shout back at me or if they're telling me that it's my fault, I know at least there's some fight left in them and that if I don't take that personally and I say, yeah, okay, um, and if it's something that I did do, I'll take it and I'll say, okay, yeah, I did that. Have you thought about why I did that? Have you thought about the reasoning behind it? Because once we're being calm, once we're sitting down and we're talking in this logical, calm manner, we can see something from someone else's perspective quite often. When we're in the fight or flight mode, it's not going to happen. So don't even bother because if they're in that, that um, I suppose, state, then it's not going to happen. All right, what else? I was also very fearful that there would never be a solution. There would never be a solution and he would never move forward. I think that every movement forward is good. 
no matter how small it might seem, how insignificant it might seem, that every move forward is a good move. So let's take it that as long as things are moving, as long as they're making some sort of choices for themselves, even though they're not your choice, then at least they are using a part of their brain. They're using a part of them. The other thing I want to say is when we were talking about energy is to look at things on a level that they are, okay? Because when you're in this state of anxiety, there's a part of that person that wants to catastrophize, wants to make it bigger than it is, wants to make it this huge, really huge part of them. The more you can cut that down as just a small part of them, okay? And if your teen says they don't want help or they don't want to talk to someone or they don't want friends, don't believe a word of it. They all want help. However, they don't want to be judged. And that's the thing, isn't it? That we don't like to be judged. But if we can take the label off and say, you know what? I always knew you were a sensitive person, a sensitive being, someone who would be empathetic to other people's problems and troubles. And you'll find a lot of the time that your teen that's anxious will want to help others. They will try and hide how they're feeling to help others. So if you find that your child is jumping in to situations and trying to help others, trying to give them um, support and guidance, that's what they really want and need. They're probably looking for it in the wrong place because they're probably picking someone who's also a victim of circumstance and will always be saying, ah, oh, but it wasn't my fault or I didn't do anything. It was all someone else. It's never all someone else, right? It's never all someone else. So if they're picking to be with those people and choosing to be always helping rather than helping themselves, know that they're actually needing that help. So I would just say, why not have a talk to someone? Why not see if someone can give you some guidance? Because as a parent, it's likely that you're too close and too emotionally involved. If you have someone who you know is a therapist or you know is a good influence for them, then please get them to just have a chat. Just pick up the phone and have a chat about why they're feeling that way. We have one in four teenagers these days who are in trouble. We say one in four, but since COVID hit, I would say it's possibly one in two. I think most teens are finding life difficult right now, just like their parents. As parents, we don't know what's around the corner, so therefore we're feeling anxious ourselves. So I'm saying to you, if you can just find a bit of calm, a bit of time to sit and just relax, a bit of time to actually have for yourself, Go out for a walk, eat something that's really nutritious, find an outlet, have a massage, talk to a therapist, whatever it is that you think is really going to help you right now. Because the more we help ourselves as parents, the more we can chill, the more we can sit in a bath full of foam or take, you know, take some time out the more we can deal with what's coming and deal with it on a daily basis. 
what's going on for them right now and give them space to talk. Put your phones away, put them to one side and just say, okay, let's just sit down and have a talk or a cuddle, put on the TV, whatever it is that can calm everyone down. So our talk today, just to recap, it's all about fear. It's all about fear because fear makes everything worse, right? We're always going to have some. We're always going to have a bit of anxiety. We're always going to have something that's happening around us. But if we can just see a way of dealing with today, dealing with tomorrow, and just having hope for the future, having hope that they will one day be able to do all the things they want to do. You know, I've seen someone who comes in and says, I can't even go out the door. It's been hard for me to get in here today. And then seeing them in maybe four weeks' time when they're going out with friends, they're going out shopping, they're buying new clothes, they're really sort of getting to grips with this feeling that they can do something. And last week I talked about the drama triangle. Um, so if you'd like to look back on that, you can always comment that you want the notes. And the notes from today, they will be available to you. There's always something, a, a small nugget. And I always think of synchronicity, right? If I'm on your mind, if you've seen this this um, segment today, it, it could be something that changes your life. So you can get a free relaxation audio, you can get the notes to today, you can even get the notes to past um, and previous segments. Just let us know. And if I can help in any way, pick up the phone. Get your anxious child to pick up the phone and just have a chat because that chat could change your life and your teen. So I'm going to say goodbye for today. And if you'd like to know more about the fear factor, about how to actually move gracefully through this period of time that can be chaotic, can be like so challenging, then if I can help, please just get hold of me. Um, I'm only too willing to help you. So I'll say goodbye for today. And anytime, just message me. Um, just leave a comment and I'll be back to you. Okay, bye for now.